This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. A safe and joyful third Sunday in Advent to all of you. Welcome to Lake Fenton United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Vincent Slocum. I'm so pleased to have you joining us this morning. Now, whether you're a longtime member of Lake Fenton United Methodist or or maybe you're relatively new to our congregation. Maybe you've only recently begun joining our worship services live on, on Facebook and, and YouTube. Either way, this morning I invite you to greet one another with a sign of God's peace this morning. If you're new to our congregation, we would love the opportunity to greet you as brothers and sisters in Christ. We would love the opportunity to know you better and welcome you warmly. Either way, We would like for you to know that here in this place, no matter where you come from and no matter who you are, no matter what baggage you may be carrying, no matter what stress or worry you may have on your plate right now, we would like you to know that here in this place you are safe, here in this place you are welcome, and we hope that here in this place you will feel as though you are at home. We believe that this house belongs to God and it is open for absolutely all people. And so we are so pleased to have you joining us this morning. Now this morning we have a very special Advent worship service. This morning we'll be continuing in our sermon series on on the many places that, that God has called home over the years. For the past two weeks, Pastor Jeremy Peters from Court Street United Methodist, a long time friend of Lake Fenton United Methodist has has been leading our our sermons for for the past couple of weeks. This morning, I'm going to be picking the torch back up to to continue the survey as we move further in in our our survey of of all of the places where, where God has called home. We also have not one, but two special musical guests who will be sharing songs of praise and worship this morning. And we also have the lighting of our third Advent candle, the Joy Candle, which will be at the end of our worship service this this morning. However, before we begin, I invite you this morning to stop, pause, allow the quiet of the space around you to surround you. Breathe deeply of God's peace and abundance and exhale the worry, fear, and stress that you have been carrying around for the past week. For many people, Advent is is a time of both joy and a time of stress, all the more so this year as we are now experiencing an Advent and a global pandemic. As we all race around to buy presents, as we all wrestle with with feelings of loneliness and isolation as we miss our friends and loved ones. This morning, I invite you to take a moment to find a quiet center within yourself. Invite God's Holy Spirit. Invite God's presence into the room with you this morning as we prepare to begin our worship. Now, as we begin our worship and song this morning, I'd like to invite Sherry Morris, the sister of our own organist, Margaret Danks, who will be helping us to begin our worship and song by sharing a special song to her, a song called The Breath of Heaven. Cold and weary 
My friends, in this season of light and darkness, this season of joy and stress, this season of love and heartache, of hope and mourning. This morning, our own Trisha Whitaker has a very special Advent prayer that she would like to share with all of you this morning. I invite you to be present with God as, as Trisha leads us all in prayer. Please join me with the prayer. Source of compassion and grace, we yearn to embody the joy of your salvation, but we are easily distracted by the demands of the season. We long to taste the wellspring of your mercy, but we are caught up in the frenzy of the holidays. Be our quiet center, that we may find your joy deep within. 
be our secret heart, that we may live lives of hope wherever we go. We pray all these things in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their father, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive those iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more. The word of God for the people of God. Back in high school, I was part of a five-man a cappella group called Bass Clef. Now keep in mind, this was back in the late 90s, the early 2000s, back when groups like the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and, and 98 Degrees were, were considered to be popular. Now, I, I need to point all these things out to you to, to help prepare you for what's about to come next. You see, that's me. <laughs> that gangly, anemic-looking train wreck holding up the wall in his Sunday best tank top there is, is me. Which means that that pose, that outfit, and that picture were all choices that I made in my senior year of high school. And it, and it actually bears just a little bit more consideration. You see, I showed up that morning wearing tearaways and a t-shirt, which means that at some point in the proceedings, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, you know what this picture really needs, what's really going to put this over the top is, is just a little bit more pasty white skin. <laughs> Now, one of the things that, that we used to do in, in my time with Bass Clef was that each of the guys in the group gave themselves a different boy band persona that we would introduce ourselves with, right? So we had, we had a bad boy of the group. We had a baby of the group. We had a nice guy of the group and a goofball of, of the group. And, and then, of course, then, of course, there was me. And so before every concert, we would introduce ourselves and each guy in the group would step forward and introduce themselves and share what their boy band persona was. Now, I was always the last one to introduce myself. And every single time it would come to me and I would pause and I would scan the room a little bit, start doing one of these with my head as I, as I looked around before stepping forward and saying, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, I give to you the eighth wonder of humankind, a man so dashing, so debonair, so handsome and charming, he makes Casanova look like Quasimodo. A man so devastatingly handsome that he makes Frank Sinatra look like William Hung. Husbands, hold on to your wives 
Fathers, hang on to your daughters. I am Vincent Slocum, and I am the good-looking one of the group. And at this point, I would have made laser focused eye contact with a young lady in the front row before firing off one final. How you doing? <laughs> I did that every single time that I introduced myself, right? That became a routine. I became known for that introduction. I even actually developed a reputation for myself as a kind of hyper confident ladies man and people ate it up. <laughs> right? As you can imagine, I as a teenage boy loved every minute of their, of their attention. Right? I had swagger for days. And I could not get enough of it. <laughs> now this morning we, we continue our survey of the many places that God has called home with a reading from the book of Jeremiah. You see, after decades of wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites finally found their way into the promised land. But even after centuries of struggle and, and challenge, the Israelites looked around and still couldn't help but feel like the little kid on the playground, surrounded as they were by all of these great and mighty empires, kingdoms like Babylon and Assyria, the Hittites and, and the Egyptians. They, they couldn't help but feel like, like the little kid on, on the playground and and so the Israelites came to God and said, you know, God, that's when, when all these other nations go to worship their gods, right? They're, they're doing it in, in great monuments. They're going into huge temples and towering ziggurats to, to worship their gods. And, and yet we've still got you here in this, in this rinky-dink tent, you know, this, this stank, musty old tabernacle, you know, people, God, people are starting to, to stop and stare. People are starting to look and, and laugh. You know, you should, you should really let us build you a proper house, right? No one's ever going to take us seriously. No one's ever going to take you seriously unless you let us build you a house that, that matches your glory and, and majesty. And at first, God was resistant to the idea, but, but eventually, after years and years of nagging, he finally gave in and said, you know what, if you have to, if you absolutely have to build me this house, then, then go ahead, fine. And so the Israelites built a majestic temple as, as the house to God right in the center of the holy city of Jerusalem and they shipped in all of these materials rare and wealthy materials from from all of these other nations and and once it was completed they couldn't get enough of it and and really that's when the Israelites started to strut right and they started doing one of these with their heads as they looked around and, and said, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, gaze in wonder at the great and mighty people of the nations of Judah and Israel, next door neighbors to God. They said, look at the majesty, the wonder and awesomeness of this great house that we have built to house the great and living God Almighty. They said, nations of the world, you can huff and you can puff, but you are not going to blow this house down. You may be big and bad, but our God will never let you destroy this great house that we have built for him. 
And so for hundreds of years, the Israelites strutted around like that until finally the unthinkable happened. An army from Babylon came marching over the horizon and proceeded to trample the holy city of Jerusalem, burned the temple to the ground, and marched the people of Judah away in chains to live in exile in Babylon. And of course, God had been warning them for years that this was coming through the words of his prophets. He had been warning the Israelites, stop strutting around, crowing about the greatness of this house that you have built for me, as though that somehow makes you invincible, as though I am somehow obligated to save you when things go badly, just because you have built me this house. He says, let me be clear, my Glory is so magnificent that you could not ever possibly build anything to match it. What could you build me that is greater than all of creation? He said, this great house that you have built has absolutely Nothing to do with my glory or the strength of our relationship and everything to do with your own fragile egos. And I promise you that it will all come crashing down around you if you don't stop. He said, if our relationship requires that we have this temple to prove it, then our relationship really was not built on all that much to begin with. And eventually it will all end. And so in today's reading, the Israelites find themselves in exile in Babylon. And in this morning's reading, God sends them a message of hope. He says, you know, I know that you're hurting. Right now, I know that right now you feel about as broken and as beat down as you can possibly be. But I promise you that this will all pass. This is all going to end. He says that a day is coming in which I will set all things to right. A day is coming in which I will write my law and my love on each and every single human heart. And you will never feel the need to go looking for me ever again. Because he says that in that day, my glory will no longer resound in clouds of fire and in thrones of sapphire. My glory will no longer dwell in dusty tabernacles or walls of stone. Instead, every single human soul will magnify my glory and sing it out to the world. And we will never be separated from one another ever again. Now, it shouldn't come as, as any surprise to, to you, although it certainly did come as a surprise to me, that, that after I graduated from, from high school, I, I fell into a bit of a slump. It turns out that when most of your confidence is, is built around people cheering and, and applauding and, and clapping every time you, you get up on the stage, then, then your confidence really isn't built on all that much to begin with, right? And, and I fell into, into kind of a personal darkness. And, and I started to look at myself and think, oh my gosh, you know, did I peak in high school, right? Is it all downhill from here? It was a difficult time for me. 
But it was an important time, right? It was a time that taught me the difference between blind egotism and humble confidence. You see, blind egotism says that I'm great. I'm doing great. And I know that I'm doing great because everyone else keeps telling me that, that I'm doing great as opposed to humble confidence, which says, you know, I did the best that I could. And some things I did really well and, and some things I did a little poorly and, and maybe could do a little better at in the future, but, but I tried as hard as I could and, and, that's, and that's okay. Now I can tell you, I am absolutely fantastic at blind egotism. I am great at it. And, and I am getting better with each passing day at humble confidence. In fact, it's a lesson that 2020 continues to teach me even to this day. You see, I thought that my faith was absolutely unshakable until the coronavirus pandemic drove us away from our sanctuaries and in-person worship services. And I came to find as the weeks passed, the cup of my spirit became harder and harder to fill with each passing week. I even found that some weeks I had trouble even filling it at all. I thought that I was absolutely up to being a pastor and stepping into the pulpit. I thought that that was going to be a breeze until I spent 20 successive Sundays preaching sermons and offering liturgy to great empty rooms, staring at the dim glow of my own face on my tablet screen. 2020 has been hard and 2020 has demanded every single lesson of humble confidence that I have ever learned in my life. But this morning I have hope. This morning I have hope in remembering that even in the most difficult weeks, even in those weeks in which my cup is at its hardest to fill and it does not get filled at all, those weeks in which I feel at my absolute lowest, my most beaten and broken down, I have hope in knowing that the God of infinite glory and the God of infinite majesty and wonder would choose to take a form as lowly and humble as my own human form, come down to earth and endure the unimaginable pain of death on the cross, all in an effort to make a heart as broken as vulnerable and as fragile as my own, his home. In order that we should never be apart. And, and that's not too bad. Will you play with me this morning? Gracious and loving God, we thank you that your love resounds so powerfully, that, you, that your confidence in glory is so great that you would choose to make a lonely heart such as our own, your home, that you would choose to walk with us on this, our vulnerable and broken walk, to stay with us, to comfort us, to strengthen us, to never abandon us, even in those times in which we fail to see you. Lord, we ask this morning that you make that a closer walk. Continue to fill our hearts and strengthen us in the days to come so that we may always come to see the ways that you are with us and within us. Amen. My friends, at this time, I'd like to introduce a very special musical guest. 
Very special musical guests, in fact. You see, one of my fellow members of, of Bass Clef was, was a young man named Tom Kaiser, one of the other guys in that ridiculous photo from, from all of those years ago was, was my very dear friend Tom. And Tom was the baby of the group. However, Tom is not a baby anymore. Tom is all grown up, and Tom has gone on to bigger and better things. In fact, Tom is now a vocal music director. He is, in fact, the vocal music director at Grand Blanc High School, where he and I sang together in bass clef all those years ago. Now, one of the traditions that we always had at, at Grand Blanc, at every single choir concert, we always closed out with the same song, The Lord Bless You and Keep You by Peter Lutkin. It was a Grand Blanc tradition, and everyone who has come through Grand Blanc Chorale knows that song. It's sung at every single concert, I believe, still to this day. Now, even in the midst of this pandemic, when... People are not able to sing together in person this, this time, which has been so difficult for so many choirs. Tom has taken it upon himself to still organize all of his students via Zoom, and, and they have put together an absolutely incredible remote version of Peter Lutkin's The Lord Bless You and Keep You, which they have so graciously shared with us this morning. And so without further ado, I am so pleased to present to you the Grand Blank High School Chorale directed by my very good friend Tom Kaiser singing, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Thank you so much, Tom, and the fabulously talented kids at, at Grand Blanc High School for so graciously blessing us with your music this morning. What an absolute treat it was. Now, before we, we light the third Advent candle on our Advent wreath, I have one quick announcement I'd, I'd like to make. Actually, it's just a request. So on your screen, you should see both my cell phone number and my email address. So for our Christmas Eve service this year, which will be December 24th on Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock, 
we'll have an, an online Christmas Eve service. And as part of that service, I would like to incorporate as many photos of Lake Fenton members and their families as I can. And so I'm encouraging all of you to, to take a picture of yourself, get your most ridiculous, ugly Christmas sweater, get your most festive clothing on, get out, break out the eggnog and and break out the, the Christmas decorations. We would love to see the decorations in your home and, and love to see selfies and, and pictures of yourselves and your family. Please send those to me. The more pictures you can get me, the better. We will use now. Know that if you're sending me the picture, be prepared to have it pop up in our in our worship service. So so don't send pictures that, that you're not comfortable with anyone seeing. But the but the more pictures you get, the more and, and more festive pictures you can send me the better so please uh, get those pictures to me again we'll be using them for our Christmas Eve service so make sure that you get them to me before Christmas Eve I ideally if you can get them to me even a few days before Christmas Eve that would be terrific because it will give me more than enough time to edit everything together and and make sure that it's it's neat and presentable for for our final worship service so uh, so again please you can text them you can email them. Um, you can also connect with me on Facebook. You can, you can message those pictures to me on Facebook. However you prefer to get them to me is, is absolutely fine. Just, just let me know. And so as we prepare to light the third candle on our Advent wreath, We've been blessed for the past two weeks with, with stories from various Lake Fenton members. When we lit the first candle, the hope Candle, we heard a story from Karen and Kamea Whitaker. Last week, we heard a story from Pat Petrella as we lit our faith candle. And, and this morning, as we prepare to light the joy candle on our Advent wreath, I would like, for, I would like to invite Karen Morrison to share a story of, of a blessed joy that, that she's received in, in her life recently. Pastor Vince has asked me to share with you a very joyful week I spent with my son, daughter-in-law, and my two granddaughters. Isla is nine and Catherine is seven. Since they wouldn't be able to come from Atlanta at Christmas, they decided to come a few weeks before Thanksgiving. At the time, I was disappointed that they couldn't make Christmas, so I decided to have Christmas at our house while they were here. After thinking about what to do, I thought, we really haven't even seen them for almost a year and we've missed many holidays. So I decided to have a holiday week and this meant celebrating a different holiday each day. This is the highlight of highlight holiday week. The first holiday would be, hol would be Halloween. So I left up my decorations. I had a banner that were made out of letters like these that said, happy Halloween. We were going to do trick or treating around the house, but first we had to wear, get our costumes. We went down the basement and went through the costumes. I was a pumpkin. When we came upstairs, the word happy was gone out of the banner and we found out that the wicked witch had stolen the letters that spelled happy. Well, we couldn't go trick or treating unless we first found the missing letters. There were clues around the house which led to them. As the girls discovered the location of the letters, the smiles and joy I saw in their faces as they raced to get the letters warmed my heart. When they defeated the Wicked Witch and had all the letters back on the ban banner, they were able to go trick-or-treating. Now, the next day is going to be Thanksgiving, but to make Thanksgiving complete, we needed to ha make a pumpkin pie. So Isla and I made a pie. She loves to cook. Of course, when the pie was done, Grandpa said, I want a piece right now, but we had to tell him that he had to wait till Thanksgiving. Well, the next day was Thanksgiving, so we took down the Halloween decorations and got out our turkey decorations. We were going to have our turkey dinner and all the fixings for dinner. Now, the week that they came up was the week we had the 70 degrees weather, so we decided to rake up the leaves so we could play in them. We put together a huge pile of leaves and jumped in them, buried ourselves in them, and had a grand time. 
If you ever watch kids play in leaves, you can picture the joy that is found in the simple things in life. The day continued with playing dodgeball and kick croquet. The next day was Christmas Eve. Again, we took down the Thanksgiving decorations and put up a small Christmas tree and my collection of Santas, which you can see behind me. As they were doing this, the girls decided it would be fun to have a secret Santa activity. So they wrote down everybody's name and we all selected a name from the bowl. The things were gifts that were gonna be those things found around the house. After they wrapped one gift, they decided it was so much fun and they told everybody they can wrap as many gifts as they want to. So after the gifts were wrapped with more tape than actually needed, they put them under the tree. However, we would not open those until the next morning. As you probably know, the next day was Christmas. Something like that. The girls woke up with excitement and anticipation of the day ahead. And it was fun to see the girls try to get their mom and dad up, remembering those past years when their parents used to try to get Gary and I up. After breakfast, the first thing we did was open the secret Santa gifts. Isla had my name and she wrapped five gifts for me, including stuffed animals, candles, and coloring books. Then it was time for opening the gifts from Grandma and Grandpa. Again, we found great joy in the little things in life because I think the girls enjoyed the secret Santa gifts the most. Now, one tradition at Christmas was for us to have apple pie. This was one of the girls' favorite desserts. So Isla and I made an apple pie. We decided to have Chinese for dinner so that I didn't have to cook. That was a joy all in itself. When we thought about going to Chinese, we thought about the movie, The Christmas Story, where the dogs ate the turkey so that they had to go out and eat in a Chinese restaurant. We got a good laugh out of that. Of course, after that time, it was pie time. For the girls, it was definitely a time of joy, having a piece of warm apple pie with ice cream put a smile on everyone's face. Now, our last holiday was New Year's. I think I have their crown on, but that's okay. <laughs> our, the day, this day, the girls and I made paper lanterns and decorated them with animals the earth, and the sky, and the sun and clouds. We did have one other outdoor fun time, but the weather was getting cold, so we couldn't stay out too long. Well, this is our holiday week, filled with love, laughter, and great joy each and every day. I hope this has brought a smile to your face and joy to your heart. I'd like to finish with a verse from Psalms 126, verse 3. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Thank you and have a good day. And so the light of Christ draws a little closer. And once again, the world has grown just a bit brighter. My friends, this morning, I invite you all to receive this word of blessing. May this week for you be a week of holidays. And may you always find a home for God within your own heart. May the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lake Fenton, I love you. God loves you. Go now in peace.